we have a couple of different sensors. You know, these were actually sensors uh, that Dr Regal made for drones. And we said, you know, we're we want to use it on a full-size helicopter, and we were the first ones to do that. Within the general world of LiDAR sensors, there are iSafe and non-iSafe lasers. And the way they will use a non-iSafe laser is simply by flying at a much higher altitude. We, we fly in the 400 to 1,000 foot uh, AGL range. So we use all iSafe sensors so that you know, no, no one's harmed <laughs> in, in using the sensor. And that's a, a big designation because someone could say, well, that's, is that safe? I mean, it's, there's a laser up in the sky and it's very important that you, you know, be able to talk about that. There are FAA regulations that talk about the different laser classes uh, and what you can use where and when. In any platform, you have really, you know, at least generally two sensors or devices that are acquiring the data. Uh, one is going to be the, the laser sensor for the LiDAR. We have 100 megapixel cameras back here but all of that needs to be connected to an IMU. So as the aircraft flies through the air and pitches and rolls and changes heading, you need really accurate data uh, out, I think it's like six or seven decimal points of a degree of exactly which way that aircraft is turning. The sensors, you know, throwing out light, you know, painting light. We have the IMU in there to detect the thing. We have detect the motion, you know, the XYZ, and we have the GPS data, then we correct that later. One of the really cool improvements that's been made just in the last year or so is the use of a subscription service uh, to do the satellite correction. Uh, you know, you can imagine the satellite is not always accurate in, as the helicopter is moving around. Uh, you can use a base station, you can use a CORS fixed base station, and now there's a subscription service that we use that we can, it makes us much more effective. We don't have to have a person on the ground setting up that, um, you know, base station. We get a point cloud. That point cloud has millions to billions of points of light in it, just uh, intense amounts of data. Uh, what's really cool about that data is it has, this is, probably reflectivity, uh, but every point of light has a ton of metadata that goes with it. So that metadata, you know, is, is the very simple part of, it has an XY, XY coordinate, and then it has an altitude component, but it also has amplitude and reflectance, and I'm gonna forget everything that, you know, it has. Uh, but that data can be, um, utilized and analyzed a number of different ways. So for example, from this is just a say a reflectance, uh, this is where the point cloud has been colorized by elevation. Uh, red is higher, blue is lower. So how do we use that data? This is a project we did uh, last June uh, for USGS and FEMA uh, on the Big Island. Uh, probably read about a little volcano that went off there and. For about four months, this volcano was creating 30,000 gallons of lava a day, which is new earth, which is just unbelievable that every second you can have that much you know, new earth coming out. And they wanted to find out what was going on under the canopy, you know, around there. Uh, we probably got within uh, probably 200 meters of the lava when it gets too hot, you know, you that you know you've sort of reached your limit there. You know, Holly Mau Mau was at that point, every 22 to 24 hours throwing up an ash cloud that was about 5,000 feet tall, but it was very regular. So we knew that if it went off at 4 a.m. in the morning, the next, you know, six to 10 hours were pretty safe to go scan and get in the midst of it because it wasn't gonna go off for another 18 hours. That didn't mean that we didn't like sort of watch really closely. But what do we, what do, we do? this? location in this screen he, that you're seeing is only about a mile or so away from where the active vent was coming up, throwing out all the lava. So again, we're only a, you know, a couple kilometers away from this vent, but it's just solid jungle. So we scanned this area and through a process that we've just loosely called digital deforestation, it takes away the forest and we get to see 
what is underneath those trees. Uh, if you think like, well, how can it see through canopy? We, we say the LIDAR can see through canopy. It really can't see through the canopy, but if you think of walking in a very dense forest and you look up, you can see sky. So if we pound that forest with enough points of light, enough points are gonna get to the ground to be able to create this map that's underneath. Uh, LIDAR is a, you know, a non-destructive, non-invasive way of surveying exactly what's there. You know, could there be, just say, ruins from a, you know, a previous civilization or on the security side, is someone doing something out there that you need to know about, yet it's completely camouflaged that no, you know, vehicle or camera, you know, eye is going to see. This is a way of determining what is out there. And, you know, collecting uh, not only what's there, but also creating a base level of data for the future. Uh, the geologists looked at this and said, you know what, all those dark lines, you know, this was maybe the previous fault, and all these skinny dark lines are the new faults. And so now we can see, flying over this, how would you know there's a fault there? So now we know where those faults are. And why is that important? Because when this subdivision was built 50 years ago, they didn't have this data. And it's probably not good to build your house in an earthquake zone where a fault is going to come through. So this is the reason FEMA was involved is, you know, helping plan for the future to see where this fault line runs for future zoning. Uh, if you think of future zoning for a house, it's the same thing as future zoning for where you're going to put a runway, where you're going to put facilities. We, you need to know what is happening with that earth and with that change. The, the first set of data that you collect is the base level. Where this data becomes incredibly valuable is with the second scan because now you have a comparison and then that value again increases when you do the third scan because now you can project. Now you can create at least a sort of a prediction for what might happen in the future. Let's just say the, you had to extend um, the runway and you had to push out you know, another you know, 300 meters of earth uh, you know, to level it out. And you've seen some cracks in the runway, but everything around it is surrounded by, you know, three or four foot, you know, grass. You can't see what's going on. By doing a LIDAR scan in con con conjunction with that imagery and then doing the analysis, you could see that, well, maybe this side is slumping off. And it's not a problem today. It's not going to be a problem tomorrow. It might not even be a problem for five years. But we think in terms of 10-year, 20-year planning, something is going to need to happen to that area. What if we're in a flood zone? Uh, you know, we used to think of the 100-year you know, flood and the 500-year flood as not in our lifetime. You know, now 500-year events happen about three times a month in our world. What's in uh, the scanner? This one has two scanners in it that are canted and clocked. The center is a 100 megapixel Nader camera, and then we have two oblique cameras that are also 100 megapixel. Why is it valuable to have canted and clocked? Well, a lot of our business is scanning electrical poles. And they're small, uh, sometimes they're frequently very dark or they're wet, and the scanner that is clocked or canted up is painting light on the front of the pole as we go past it, uh, the other scanner is collecting the back side of the pole. Where that's valuable with infrastructure is that, just say we have an overhang on a building, the building footprint is going to look like the overhang because you can't see the edge. With a 10 degree cant on the front and the back, even if we pick up just a very few points on the side of that structure, we can now calculate a true square footage calculation of the, you know, what the volume is of that building versus what the, over, the roof might be. This is an example of that. Uh, this is data that we collected from the volcano. Fortunately, they had a set from 2006. Now, you know, rooftop, you can see, you know, a few little trees, and then the multicolor data is the data that we collected. Here's the example of where you can, you know, begin to see just the sides of the building and where the overhang would be. 
after our first collection, they, uh, the engineering company we work with sent a person to process the data. They processed the data and they said, it's, it, it's not right, there's a problem. The metadata, you're looking at the wrong datum, it's not in the right place because this house isn't where it was. For three or four hours, they're like, how do we figure this out? How do we get the, the different datums to line up? And they called USGS and I said, no, our base stations are moving a centimeter a day. So when you came home after this earthquake, your house was not in the same place. And this shows in very dramatic fashion that it moved maybe a meter and a half to the east and dropped a meter or so. The USGS project that we did, USGS has two standards for their uh, current three depth program where they're redoing the LIDAR data of the entire US. One is two points, one is eight points. We delivered an average of 101 points across uh, 40,000 acres. And they, you know, now coming back going, we need your help to write a spec for 100 points per square meter. The, the other cool part about the technology is that every point, it's just, it's an XYZ with a lot of metadata that then gets post-processed. The post-processing and analytical software gets better by the day so that the data that we have here is enhanced by better software in the future. This data will only get more accurate as time goes on, not less accurate. There are two types of accuracy that people, that are used in the industry. One is relative accuracy, which means, is this point always gonna be this distance from the next point? That's the relative accuracy, that's always in the you know, 10 to 15 millimeter range. The absolute accuracy is where is this point in the world? So that means you're flying at 85 miles an hour at 1,000 feet, shooting out a bunch of pulses, and you can tell whether my coffee cup is here or here. It's absolutely incredible, the, you know, the, the accuracy that they have been able to achieve with the different processes. This is, a, this is our airport. So we scan the airport, we can take that data and lay it into, say, a Google Earth, and we've used that metadata that comes with the LIDAR to determine the height of the runway. You know, the red is roughly 20, meter, 20 meters above sea level, and the blue is going to be 18 meters. So we've got maybe, what's that, a meter change from one end to the other, but we've been able to look at that data and analyze it in a very you know, precise, narrow kind of way. So you can see, well, you know, this end of the runway is lower, this one's higher. But if you look a little bit closer, you go, you know, there's a, there's a low point in here on the sides, but it crowns in the center when you begin to look at it. Uh, let's isolate that. Let's get rid of everything else now and just look only at the runway. You think of a topographic map, it's, you know, it's a hiking map, it might be a, a meter or five meters. You know, we're doing one, two, ten centimeter type topo maps. So you're creating a very finely tuned topographic map of the runway surface. You know, how much area, I mean, how much dip does water need to collect? You know, a quarter of an inch. This is our ramp uh, after a rainstorm. I know water collects there, but let's quantify that and take that area and see what it looks like, where that water is coming from, where it's going. Well, this is that pond. If you look in the back, there's a, a sort of a concrete spillway or drain, and that's represented up here. You can see exactly where the water is going to flow there's a, a tool that uh, can be called a watershed analysis, a water drop tool, a flood model, so that you could take this, just make it all black and white, and then incrementally raise the water level a centimeter at a time to see where that water is going to go next. And this is an example. This, isn't, this is a different airport. Uh, this is a 100 megapixel image. In this case, it was a non-towered airport in the middle of nowhere, Texas. So we said, let's just use this as an example to see what we can find. Because you're, you're probably not going to allow traffic in you know, while we're doing our 
little run. The other part too is that, well, it took 20 minutes. We don't need to shut down traffic for 20 minutes. We can make one pass, 30 seconds, jump out, wait for 10 jets to land, come back in, do the next pass, and then put all the data together. So it does not need to be collected absolutely time-wise sequentially. We could do a pass this morning, do another pass this afternoon, and then put those together. But if we want to look up at this area, very small piece, and this is what we're seeing. It's if you looked at the first picture, you're like, oh, there's a light there, but when we zoom in, we know that that light has been run over. Uh, so we collect the high resolution imagery simultaneously with the LIDAR data. The INS or IMU in the front collecting the pitch angle and roll of the aircraft, that same data goes to both the cameras and to the laser so that they can be synchronized later. If you, if you think of an optical bench, we've turned ours upside down in this case, and all of the, the sensors hang from the optical bench so that they all um, align. We do, once we've bolted everything in, we do a boresight test and run it through different softwares to get the exact offsets of where the, the sensor might be and where the IMU is. Uh, the cameras are also all calibrated. Uh, so there's like a six-page document that comes with it that shows, you know, the relationship of the, literally the pixels in the, the photo detectors within the sensor to the lens and how that's all put together. So. The airport, the runway, let's just say, doesn't change, but everything around it does change, and that affects our lives from noise abatement. You know, is there a new neighborhood? Uh, we're, we're obviously seeing that with Santa Monica. You know, people build their houses after the runway, you know, was there. Uh, again, I don't know all the standards, but I'm sure there are requirements for how many structures, how many houses are within a certain proximity, let alone knowing where the, you know, the, uh, the flight paths should be and someone building in, in the midst of it. How do we do that and do it on an efficient basis? Well, certainly we can open up a photograph and somebody can just sit there and count and mark off all the buildings. But because the LIDAR data is simply math, we can apply AI to it. And this is a, a gas corridor. The, uh, the federal regulations on oil, gas, I'm not sure about Canada, but at least in the US, are very strict on what is within a quarter mile or an eighth of a mile on either side of a, of a gas line. So we'll do a, a high resolution scan, isolate an area. The software goes in and says, well, you know, a tree is sort of like a bunch of points like this but a house or a structure has very square, you know, straight lines. So the algorithm is gonna go in and say, you're a house, you're a tree. And then the algorithm is gonna say, how many of those square things are there? And you have a house count. Now the cool part is, is that this is just from year one, but next year you can go back in and do another scan and see how many new houses have been built or new structures built or taken away. And that, you know, again, could f affect what regulations, what area, what impact that affects. So when you're thinking of the LIDAR data, it's not just the airport grounds, but it can be, you know, you're already in the air. The extra time to fly another 500 feet or 1,000 or 2,000 feet on either side of the airport property is almost inconsequential, whether you process it or not. Acquire the data so that you have it for future planning. We need to know what's out there so that we can talk to city planning about issuing permits. You know, right now the zoning might be they can put up a, you know, a 50 foot or 100 foot building and it's a mile or two miles away from the airport. Well, we add, you know, another thousand feet to the runway. That completely has changed. We need to know today what that landscape and that footprint looks like so that we can plan for the future. And we sort of pull everything together here, uh, you know, at Hawthorne. Uh, just sort of a video of, you know, putting all these different pieces together. You know, the pilot view is important to the pilot, but what we want is to be able to look at the underlying GIS data because everyone in this room are the ones that make it safe for the pilots and those passengers to land. Uh, another really cool use of it is with archaeology. 
and that's an area that we're, that we're pursuing now. And they're using LIDAR data, again, to see through the canopy to see what archaeological ruins are hidden by the canopy. Uh, we just did a, uh, a scan in Colombia. There was a known site that had been partially restored, uh, and you could walk there and, and see what it looks like. There were a couple of other areas where they had done ground survey and had known, you know, and we were able to show them the extent of what they knew was under the canopy. But after we looked at the data, the archaeologist literally just went crazy because he's like, we found seven more sites in this valley that he had no idea existed and the pathways and roads that connected them. This is an area that today has zero inhabitants. Back then, I'm guessing Francisco, 100,000 people were there. So we are literally discovering an ancient civilization below the canopy. It, it's really cool.